Hello and welcome to the first episode of Disappeared the Abyss. I am Jacob and I'm here with Alina. And Alina, what's the premise of our our podcast? Well, when I first started to be interested in true crime, you introduced me to Disappeared. And we both, I think, watched almost all the episodes that are out there that we could find and were really interested in Disappeared. And now that we've been waiting for the latest season to come out for a very long time, but it hasn't come out still, we decided that we wanted to go back to all the old episodes and revisit them. And also, since we would discuss them anyways among the two of us, record them and make them our new project and our new podcast. Yeah, that's exactly it. We've seen probably all the episodes of Disappeared that are out there, give or take maybe one or two for whatever reason. But yeah, so we were kind of familiar with these cases, having seen them. For me, it's been like since 2009, I think is the first time that I got into maybe 2010 or right whenever Disappeared, I think was coming out um, is when I got into the show. So we're taking a trip down memory lane to kind of watch some of these episodes again with uh, another second pair of eyes after seeing them the first time. And uh, we're starting with our first case, which is episode one. Uh, What was the name of episode one? It's called The End of Innocence. And it discusses Brandy Allen Wells' case. She disappeared on August 3rd, 2006 in Longview, Texas. And she was only... 23 years old at the time. Did you remember the case when you went back to rewatch it this time? Did you remember it from watching it the first time? Only vaguely. Um, I didn't really have, uh, didn't remember too many of the details. So it was good to go through and watch it uh, again. I've actually watched it a couple times since uh, originally watching it. So Brandy Ellen Wells, she's 23 years old at the time of her disappearance. She lives in a place called Brownsboro, Texas. And what does she do? This is on August 3rd was the day of her disappearance. And she was driving to Tyler, Texas. And she basically goes to visit her mom's house. And her mom has uh, some other kids in her family. And she goes up there to tell her that uh, she wants to have some fun before heading to a semester at college. So Brandy basically had recently moved back to East Texas to pursue a teaching degree at community college. Uh, She had a scholarship with the Flag Corps. And friends said that she was excited to get back to school after being out of school for a couple years. She had some life changes that just made it so she was not pursuing her education at the time, but she was going to get back into it. She would was excited, uh, but she wanted to do a little celebrating before she went back to school. Uh, What did uh, Brandy want to do, Alina? She wanted to go out to Grand Central Station in Longview. Um, Her family, however, was under the impression that she would stay um, in Tyler and go to the Electric Cowboy, which is the club there. So she didn't really uh, tell them about her concrete plans to go to a club that she hadn't been to before. And she was also going to go all by herself. She asked several people, like her sister, to come with her, but she couldn't. And she also asked her mother for gas money because she didn't have that much left in her tank. But her mother was unable to give her any. And so she stopped by a bowling alley and Tyler and visited a family friend there and got a drink on her mom's tap before she headed to Longview, Texas to Grand Central Station. Yeah, and this was kind of an interesting interaction that she has here at the bowling alley because she basically starts talking with a friend, a family friend who's also the bartender there at this uh, bowling alley. And she, Brandy gets there, she gets a drink on her mom's tab, mind you, that'll be kind of important because we'll realize later that Brandy does not really have any money with her. So she gets this drink on her mom's tab and the family friend says that Brandy is acting really nonchalant. She's kind of sitting there twirling her hair, having a good time. She tells the friend about her plans to head to Graham Central Station. Uh, This is 45 minutes away from Tyler in Longview, Texas. So it's a, a bit of a drive 
Um, and the friend tells her to be very careful because, weirdly enough, this uh, bartender and friend had a, her own friend go missing after being in a bar in Tyler about two decades ago. So she kind of issues this warning to Brandy, understanding that she wants to have a little fun and let loose, but also telling her to be careful um, and a little bit of foreshadowing of basically where this case will will head and the friend even remarks that she was a little angry because brandy kind of had the same attitude as that friend that had disappeared kind of you know not seem the message that she was trying to send to be careful didn't seem to really be getting through to her so what happens after that so we know that she arrived in longview at the club at ten forty p.m And we know that because she was caught on surveillance video. Actually, they, in the beginning, mistake someone else for her and kind of got the wrong, the time wrong for when she arrived. But later they find out that she did get there at around 1040 p.m. And she asked people in the club for gas money money as well. And we know that even before arriving, she called the club several times because she got lost on the way there. So we can only guess that if she... And I want to talk about that for a second. Because, (laughs) so she, yes, she called the club a couple times. Remember, this is like 2006. People don't have GPS on their phone. They're kind of navigating old school. Uh, So she's calling a couple times. But then I was also reading that this was not necessarily a hard club to find. It was like right off the highway that she would have been on. There's basically like one exit that would take you more or less right to it. So that was already something that kind of stood out to me. Um, If nothing else, just suggesting that she really didn't know this area very well, was not familiar, which instantly you're kind of like, okay, why did she even go there? You know, how does she even think of this place to go to? Why did she go 45 minutes when, as her mom would say, there was a club right in Tyler that she would normally go to, had been to in the past that was close by. And I looked this up too, and her mom basically never really asked where Brandy was going when she said she was going out with friends. She just assumed that naturally Brandy was going to be going to the club that she had gone to before Mm -hmm. and was close by. So we already know she's headed out in an area where presumably she has never really been before because she doesn't know where this is. She's calling the club multiple times to figure out where it is. And already the red flag should be going up. Yeah. And from when I looked at the map, it seemed like there were several ways um, that you could take to get from Tyler to Longview. So maybe she didn't take the one that had her come, like, exit the highway right where the club was at. Um, So I could see her getting lost like that. But it does go to show, like you said, that she's really not familiar with the area she's in at that night. And um, what I also read is that just the scene at the club in Tyler is a very different scene from uh, Grand Central Station and Longview. So... I mean, this is all speculation and we don't like we obviously don't know why she really decided to go there that night, but it could just be because she wanted to go to a club with a different scene. So, I mean, there's many other options, but that's definitely one I think is out there. And so she's at the club for, what, a couple hours at least. Um, By the way, they're getting all of this because of they have security cameras at the club. There's some outside and inside. And they also, when she checks in, she has to swipe her ID card uh, to get into the club so they know based on that timestamp when she's arriving. So some of this is documented in, um, in records, and we know through that yeah she's Um, really not there for a long time like you said um and i read this somewhere online too that you it was ladies night that night so i'm not 100 percent sure if that meant that um for her to get in that was really cheap or for free but definitely like made sense for her not having much money that she could at least still get in um but with regards to any drinks that she might have had I didn't read anything about her having any drinks there because in the beginning it was like, okay, if she doesn't have money for gas, how she's going to pay for any drinks. But it doesn't seem like she did, or maybe she was hoping someone would buy her a drink. I also read that they're usually pretty cheap there. 
So all of these are options too, but she didn't, considering she didn't stay very long I and she would have to drive back, I guess she wasn't drinking much and was really just trying to find someone because that's what we, what we read and what they discussed and disappeared is that she really just like talked to a bunch of people, like trying to find someone who would give her money for gas, right? Or yeah, that that's what what you definitely too? what I saw. That's what I saw too, which is interesting because uh, there's very little mention of her really ha- having a good time. It doesn't seem like there were too many accounts of her like dancing or, as you said, probably not drinking. Really, it did seem like uh, whether it was the whole uh, however many hours she was there, I don't know, but certainly a good portion of it seems to have been spent trying to talk to people, uh, maybe looking for some money. We do know a little bit about what happened in more detail at the club uh, because of someone who was there. But to get to that part of the story, we really have to talk about where her car ended up being found. So this is the next day, 9.15 in the morning. The Longview Police Department will find an abandoned car. It's a 2000 Pontiac Black Grand Prix, and it's parked on I-20 westbound off of the side of the road. So this is basically just an abandoned car Uh, Not too out of the ordinary to see that on a highway. The deputies, they are going to run the plates of the car, uh, but nothing will come up. So they put a tag on it, you know, eventually expecting the owner to come and find it. Now, about 15 minutes later, 930 in the morning is when Brandy's mom will wake up and she will find out that Brandy has not come home and that her clothes and her makeup and all of her things aren't there. She's not on the couch where apparently she would usually be. So as a mom would do, she starts calling Brandy's cell phone and she's just seeing that it goes straight to voicemail every time, which is not something that uh, she says would usually happen. You know, Brandy would call, either answer, or I guess call back or, you know, hear the voicemails that they were leaving and uh, and get in touch that way. Uh, and this just kind of continues for a long time, so at least a couple days uh, afterwards that her mom has not heard from Brandy, so she files a missing persons report. Um, and that's when she finds out that uh, Brandy did not go to the local cu- club there in Tyler, which was the Electric Cowboy, and she finds out instead that she went to Longview and Graham Central Station, and that's when the alarm bells really start to, to go off. And just with this um, taking a while, so we have her car spotted and we already know she's not in it the next morning. Um, But just because it takes way longer to even figure out that she never went to the local club and um, to figure out where she actually went and for a missing persons report to be filed, crucial time does get lost in her case. Um... They do eventually go to her car once uh, Longview police uh, knows that she's missing and uh, realizes that that's her car. And um, and then once they find the car, basically, they so this is um, a little while after they're able to connect the dots and find this car, and they are cross reference that and find out that there's a missing re- persons report out for this vehicle because, you know, Brandy's mom reported her missing. So they're able to connect these dots, but it's been a little while. So they search the car and there are a number of things in here that start giving them concern because, first of all, they look at the car and they see that the driver's seat has been pushed all the way back. Now, Brandy's a short girl and she would not have been able to drive the car with the seat the way that it was. That's according to her mom, who says she would never have been able to reach the pedals with the seat pushed back. It was more for someone who's well over six feet. Uh, So that's already an indication that something is wrong here. The door of the car is also ajar a little bit. It's obviously off to the side of the road, pointed west. They also find a napkin in the back with a name and a phone number on it. And uh, who does that phone number and name belong to? A guest that she met at the Grand Central Station that she also talked to and asked for gas money. And they do talk to him and he is not a suspect in her case. He basically didn't have uh, cash on him. Like otherwise he says he would have helped her out. 
Um, and so he, yeah. Yeah, so he he was unable to help her out that night with gas money. Um, but And I heard they, he offered to buy her a drink, right? And she declined? Yeah, I think they say that and disappeared, right? In the episode. I didn't read that anywhere else. But um, so it, it seems like, yeah, that she would decline it, right? It seems like she was at that point not really thinking about the fun night out anymore, but maybe just trying to figure out how she's going to make it back home. Yeah, uh, that's that's the feeling that I got too. So that doesn't end up really being as much as a lead as they had hoped it was yes. going to be. He doesn't really end up having much information other than at that point we know as we talked about she wasn't really looking to keep the night going she was focused on uh getting home or going somewhere exiting leaving the club and and getting gas in her car so there's no real sign of a struggle found near the car there's no sign of brandy obviously either they find a few other things that are interested in her interesting in her car they find a cell phone which for a long time they believe is hers and later find out that it does actually belong to her ex-boyfriend who's in the military and not in the States at that point. Um, and they also, so that kind of is a big deal because they it takes time away from the, for them to like track her actual cell phone because they thought they had it for a while. Um, they later... Do, once they realize that that's not her phone, they track it and find the individual that has her phone at the time. And he basically gives them a story about how he found it on the side of the road in kind of a uh, harder or like more rough part of Longview in the, the southern part of Longview. Um, but he, in, when we when I watched Disappear, they claimed that he... Uh, didn't want to take a lie, a polygraph test. But from what I read online, there were three people that supposedly had her phone at some point, and they all took polygraph tests, and one person failed. So I'm not 100% sure if that was him. Do you know? That was the report that I saw, too, is that there were three people who either found the phone or had the phone at some point. And the report that I saw, which was from this year, they just did another story talking to Brandy's mom about this. They said that reportedly at least one person failed the polygraph test, which is probably some new information since when the disappeared episode was released because they don't make mention of that in the show. So it does seem like at least one person failed a polygraph test related to Brandy's cell phone. I also want to point out how um, dedicated her mom is to finding Brandy at this point because you mentioned that uh, for a long time they didn't know that the cell phone in the car was not Brandy's, that it was the ex-boyfriend's. And so once they figured that out, they did try to get Brandy's records for her cell phone, her actual cell phone. But because they had to go through the courts and get a subpoena to do that, um, Brandy's mom essentially went to a friend of Brandy's who was on the same cell phone plan, and she asked her to log into the account and see the records themselves. So they were actually doing more of the police work and faster than the police were able to do it. So they got the records through the person who was also on Brandy's cell phone plan. And then they are the ones who put it together that were finding these phone calls that had started. I mean, maybe at that point, too, they didn't really trust the police as much since they had mistaken another cell phone for hers for all this time and they really knew that this much time has already been lost and we really got to find out now so they probably realized how urgent this was and did everything they could to find out yeah absolutely Um, A week after Brandy disappears, they're looking at the call logs and they find out that there are these calls that start taking place that last between one and two minutes. So very brief calls, kind of suspicious, and they suggest maybe this is some drug user or drug dealer or some sort of drug phone. And the story that the man who finds the phone gives, and this is something I think is interesting, is that he uh, says that he finds it 
days and days after Brandy actually disappears because it's making a noise along the side of the road yes. in this bad part of town. And my instant thought is like, battery life on a phone i just don't see it lasting that long i know this was like back in 2006 and the phones weren't as fancy and didn't have big screens and stuff but to my recollection there were not cell phones that were staying alive for eight or nine days i did uh, read something about that actually um in a forum i read that one person said like oh i used to have a phone that would you know like run up for up till 10 days without charging it but then on the same forum Actually, someone who claims to be, and I guess probably is, um, Brandy's godmother, uh, she said that her Brandy's mother and her blew up her phone, like calling so many times that until it basically went dead. So there's no way, you know, someone found it without it being having been charged in between. And that's already super suspicious uh, right there. And we know that from the family themselves that Brandy was not the most prepared person. So I have to imagine, too, the cell phone was probably not fully charged when she left for Longview from Tyler. So it's probably not even starting with a full battery. So, yeah, the story of how they came across this cell phone and what they were doing with it uh, is suspicious, to say the least. We have a few more things found in the car. Uh, one thing that gets talked about a lot is um, a can for gas, basically, that her family says is in typical of Brandy to have that in her car with her. Um, and that was found, uh, I think, not in the trunk. I read somewhere that that was like wrong reporting that it was in the trunk, but it's like on the back seat. Um, and I don't think we know whether there was any gas in it or not. And also, we don't have like super clear information on whether there was still gas in her tank when they found her car, because the police did fill up her tank to some extent to make it run. And from everything I read online, people are not happy with that. Like, they really want to know whether, you know, the reason that she was off the road, like, despite the whole thing, like, looking suspicious with with her seat, the driver's seat being pushed back all the way, like, that really looks really bad. But do we think that her car just gave up because there was no gas is that why she had to pull over at that point maybe like and then someone else tried to get it running and you know sat on in it like we don't really know because we don't know for sure whether it was 100 percent empty or there was still you know a tiny bit of gas left in it so there's really not like a clear information i could find i mean do you have anything on that no, I, I think you're right that we just don't know for whatever reason about the status of how much gas was in the car. We also really don't know much about the gas can. I, I read kind of conflicting information, too. Um, in the Disappeared episode, they say the family doesn't remember whether or not or doesn't really think that that would have been something she had in her car. I saw other reports that said it just straight up wasn't hers. Uh, which is interesting if that's the case. Um, I find it most likely to be that I I lean towards thinking it's not hers and that that, you know, may have been some sort of clue into what happened to her because we know that she was uh, in a situation without much gas in her car, regardless of how much, exactly how much wasn't in there. We know it was low and she was asking people for money, needed gas, even asked her mom before she left if she could use her car instead. Uh, But her mom said that my car also has not much gas in it too. So I think it's, you can't overlook the importance of the gas equation here and how that may have contributed to whatever ended up happening to Brandy. And we know she was asking strangers uh, for money to get gas. And what if she found a stranger who said, let me take you to get gas? Yes, that situation she was in that night definitely made her very vulnerable to anybody who came across her and had bad intentions just because she needed something and she was in an unfamiliar place and it was late at night. So all of those things combined already just didn't put her in a good position for for that night. I want to add for the guest, uh, Ken, that I did read her ex-husband, which I don't think we mentioned, that she was married and recently got divorced. Um, Her ex-husband, who was a police officer, apparently when the two of them drove around and I don't know if that was in her car or his car or they had a car together but they used to carry a gas can with the can with them from what I read so yeah I'm just really I have no idea could it be hers could it be like a super important clue 
to me it could be either um just yeah. wanted to add that too and we have another important thing like they found her purse in her car too which initially made people suspect that she made it back to her car she must have made it back to put it in there but i also read that from from the same source, which claims to be her godmother on a forum online, um, she said that um, she didn't take it inside the club with her. So it's not like 100% an indicator, like according to that source. So I guess, yeah, perhaps take it with she a didn't want to carry that around. We don't know in the for club. sure. But it could also be that she just didn't take it with her and it remained in the car all the time. So I just wanted to mention that too. Do you have anything else on the car? It- well, well, on the car, yes, because I think it's also important to point out the location of where the vehicle was found. Um, essentially, what they say is that it was not all that far from the neighborhood and area where her cell phone was found. That is to say, the neighborhood was in a place that you could easily access the uh, more or less the on ramp, I guess, to the freeway to I twenty here. So it there is a logical path from where her cell phone was found to where her car ended up. I don't know that that really helps us figure out what happened to her, but it does kind of make sense that there is at least a logical direction from uh, where her cell phone landed versus where they found the car. Yes, and there are several. When I looked at the map, there are several ways you could have gotten to where they found her car from uh, where they found the cell phone. But you never know, you know, it could have been, like, if they actually dropped it off there prior to dropping off the car or later or... Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know that, right? We don't know anything about that. Yeah, and I mean, we should note that they obviously did searches um, for her. They brought out... Uh, canines and uh, on foot patrols and everything like that. But as we talked about earlier, they lost a lot of time on this case, kind of following some false leads. They misidentified her in the video uh, from the club. They didn't figure out that the cell phone in her car was not actually hers. So they lost some time here. And that was not exactly great for trying to search the woods and the areas around um Uh, the club and her car ultimately nothing really turns up and the only clues and evidence they have is uh what we have already told you about in the car and um, her whereabouts at the club so the the attempts to find her or any more clues uh, don't really pan out yeah so did you mention that behind the club runs a ravine and you kind of have like a rural area like close by so like close by to where they found her car it's like oil fields it's really rural um one thing that stood out to me too with you you mentioned you know they lost some time they have people out there searching they had kind of canines um and it brought up in the disappeared episode that because it's been a couple times and it had rained that the dogs weren't able to you know find a trace find her scent um And that got me thinking, because I definitely know of cases where dogs were able to find scent and find traces uh, months later, like way later. Um, And so that got me a little confused. And I did some research, and from what I read, is that it really depends on how you train the dog. If you train them to find like even the tiniest of scent, then um, they could potentially find a scent or a trace even months later. And uh, if you don't do that, then you could have dogs and also depending on the ability of the dog in general that aren't able to find any um, after a few days or after it rains. So it really could depend. Um, But that was really interesting to me to find out because in the beginning, I was like, how is that possible that they couldn't find anything, even though they had them out there, you know, like not months or years later, but within a couple of days or weeks, I think pretty soon after. Right. Yeah. Right. So overall, what do you make of this? What do you think ultimately happened to Brandy? Uh, It sounds, even though that is usually the most unlikely scenario, it does sound like she uh, met a stranger who just didn't have the right intentions. I mean, I always want to be careful with speculation and they definitely make it very clear that we have no idea. I mean, she wasn't found until today. Um, and that must suck. Like, that must be so horrible for her family. 
um, they never gave up. You know, they try to get media attention and everything on this case and don't give up hope. And from what I read, they believe that um, human trafficking may play a role in her case. And it's hard to say, you know. Um, yeah, I, I believe in the in the possibility that, you know, someone took advantage of the vulnerable position she was in that night. And uh, maybe the wrong person hof- offered to help her. And um, she may not be alive anymore at this point. But uh, do I know for sure? Obviously not. What do you think? What do you make of her case? Yeah, I think certainly she did not disappear of her own volition. You know, whatever happened to her was not something that she predicted or wanted that night. You know, she wasn't running off. I think that's that's pretty clear. Um, I find it interesting just the position that she was in in her life at this time, Um you know, she was just getting things back together, getting back in school, getting a scholarship uh, after her life kind of took a detour with a marriage that didn't work out. Um, they say that Brandy was anxious about uh, rejoining the flag corps and maybe just the point that she was in in her life. And I can understand why she wanted this last night to kind of let loose, you know, um, get ready for some big changes. This was a pivotal time in her life, and I can understand why she was wanting to let loose a little bit and get prepared for what was next. But I think that may have caused her to, you know, throw some caution to the wind and do some things that I don't know that she would maybe normally do. Um, And I think ultimately what happened to her is tragic. And I think someone, like you said, took advantage of someone who was in a a vulnerable position away from home by at least 45 minutes without much gas in her car. We don't know exactly how much, but we know she needed gas. And I think she was hoping to get some help from a stranger. And I think whoever that stranger was did not have any intention of helping her and instead uh, took advantage of the situation. As far as trafficking goes, you know, that's one of those things that's kind of always thrown around um, when people, especially young women, yes. disappear. I did read that, you know, that area of Texas is a hot spot for that. I read but that I think too. It, it, I think it's still hard to say because it, there's if that is the case, you rarely have the follow-up. It's rarely like you have the proof and you find out that's what happened to them for sure. So if that is the case, I don't know that we'll ever get a resolution to this case, which is really tragic to think about. I hope, obviously, that that is not the case. But I think regardless, someone took her and I think the odds of her being alive to this day uh, are probably relatively low. Although I know that from watching the interview from just this year, her mom is still holding out hope that perhaps Brandy has been trafficked and maybe she is alive, not likely in the area, but somewhere else. And I think that would probably be the best case scenario for this case. Yes, I agree. That would be the best case scenario. And even if we don't think it's the most likely thing that happened, I do think yeah, we we do hold out hope that she's alive as long as there is even the slimmest chance for that to be the case. Do you think that this case can be solved? Yes, I think we have so much in this case, like so many things they found out, many people they could talk to again, more people that she probably talked to at the club that were there that night. So, yeah, I think this case is solvable. And after all, someone out there, you know, knows what happened to her. Always keep that in mind. What what do you think? I agree. I think there are a lot of people who were in that club who, if just one of them happened to see something, did she get into someone else's car that night? Did she get into her own car just by herself? Um, Did she have a conversation with someone in the club where she gave an indication about what she was planning to do after the club? Um, Anything like that. I think the three, two or three at least individuals who are associated with her cell phone definitely have 
more information about what happened to her. There's just too much of a coincidence that someone just finds a cell phone on the road in a bad area of town, decides to start using it a week after a young girl who owns that phone disappears. Yes. Um, and the fact that they may have failed a polygraph test, you know, obviously those aren't super reliable, but it's something, it can give the police something to go off of. And you hear from the investigators in the show that they have suspicions about those individuals. They just don't have the proof. So hopefully maybe there is some other piece of evidence or one of them comes forward or maybe one of them gets charged with an unrelated crime and in the process of that crime, they are compelled to open up about things in their past. And we get some details that way. I think there, the good news is there are many paths that investigators can go down to find some sort of resolution for this case. Yeah, definitely just what you said, too, is that if anybody remembers anything from that night and someone who hasn't talked to the police or someone who has talked to them but remembered something later, like anything that tells us more about what happened to Brandy after she left the club, after she walks off the camera, that would already be so helpful. Like you said, did she drive away in her own car? Like all those little pieces matter. No, you should, if, you know, someone vis is a witness, should never think that there is anything that's not important. It could, like even the tiniest thing could be very important, a very important observation. And with time passing, there is always, like you talked about, um, the people who have been in the possession of her phone, but there could also, even if they know more but maybe don't know at all, um, there could be other people who know what happened to Brandy. And with time passing, you know, it could be a girlfriend of, a, of that person or someone who just, you know, know like breaks up with, with whoever did something to her or not or knows more, though, but... You know what I mean is um, that with time passing, that person could really look in their heart and find the strength to like talk, come forward, and we really help this case out to be solved. If we had, you know, people, other people besides whoever is the main. I mean, yeah, you never know. It could be several people, yeah. but if someone knows that... and comes forward, that would always be very helpful and. With time passing, there is increasing chance of that happening. What do you think? Yeah. Even a small piece of information, I think, could be a big break for this case. 